Welcome. I thought we might have a look at interpretation of cerebral CT scans. Kind of a practical guide for the important scans, both traumatic and non-traumatic in the emergency department. Um, so we'll do this by going through some images on a, on a PowerPoint presentation. And with a bit of laugh, it won't be dead by PowerPoint. Okay, we're gonna look at only the important stuff. So, so first of all, I will try and decrease the total number just so that the important stuff gets through. When you do get a cerebral CT scan done <clears throat> inside trauma, whether it's penetrating or non-penetrating trauma, they will do it, um, the radiology pool will on a cerebral window. I mean, you could change the window, but on a cerebral window, there's specific things you can see. That is, the bone on the outside is white, hyperdense. Uh, the fresh blood, because of the iron content, is white, it's hyperdense. The CSF, understandably, is going to be dark, like inside here, and outside the ear is dark or black. <clears throat> so, what's the most important from a trauma point of view that we need to know that can go for life saving surgery? Well, it's not a tough question, but of course, it's an extradural. Now, the extradural is, is the collection of blood, it'll be an arterial spurter that's between the table of the skull and the dura. Now, it's actually limited by the cranial sutures. And I put this red line down the center of this picture because it shouldn't go past that. This is actually an incorrect demonstration of it because the extra dura should stop there, which is why as it strips off the dura, it can only go a certain length and then it has to go inwards, which is why it does that compression of the underlying cerebral tissue. Relatively simple to, to see because they're usually well, overwhelmingly acute, so they look white on your um, CT scan and they look a bit like this. So that convex, you can see it pushing inside to the underlying cerebral tissue. We can't see a fracture here, but there will be a fracture there because it's on the bony window. And you can imagine this arterial spurter pushing in here and causing effacement of the lateral ventricle. It seems that only your cervix, <laughs> well, not my cervix, but a cervix and a lateral ventricle is the only thing in medicine that actually gets effaced. And there's a midline shift. So if you drop a line through here, you can see what, there's about a centimeter midline shift at the top. So there's the extradural and there's the effacement of the lateral ventricle. And here it says, here lies good old Fred, a great big rock fell on his head, RIP. And it may be this sort of injury that caused Fred to die. So there's another extradural example of an extradural hematoma. So 32 year old collapsed after drinking a beer and smacking his head on the concrete. There's said Fiji and B. <clears throat> and here you can see that again, there's that characteristic appearance of an extradural acute extradural hematoma. There's compression of the surrounding tissue and some midline shift and effacement of the lateral ventricle. Again, we're not on a bony window, so we can't see the overlying fracture that will be there. This is a neurosurgical emergency. <clears throat> 16 year old boy smacked over the head with a cricket bat, gray nickels probably, maybe a scoop. And here you can see, you see how it, it hits the suture line and can't go beyond it. You can see this extradural hematoma pushing the surrounding tissue. You can imagine this could cone very, very rapidly. Uh, there's the overlying hematoma of the scalp. And even without the bony windows, you can see this sort of comminuted fracture of, of the bone, the skull bone, a neurosurgical emergency. Okay, they're pretty easy to identify the um, acute extradurals. Let's look at subdural hematomas, which of course are often acute, but they also may be subacute or chronic. Now, subdural hematomas, generally there's a, a um, uh, a movement of the brain as it shears the veins between the dura and the arachnoid villa. And that collection of blood um, often occurs, say, with anything that you do do sudden um, deceleration, such as in a car accident. So <clears throat> here in the subdural space, it's not limited by the cranial sutures like the extradural is. As a re result, it becomes crescent shaped 
and can be prolonged and can be very, very long. We'll see the example of that in a second. So acute subdural hematoma, it's an acute, it's got blood, you'd expect it all to be white. And there we can see it here, all the way along there, well, it's a couple of centimeters wide, and all the way down there. There's been obliteration of the lateral ventricle. There's about well, two centimeters midline shift. You can see the sulci has got some CSF on, on this side, but it's been all pushed out because of the um, area that's taken up by the subdural hematoma. Okay, as the subdural hematomas change over time, then the, as the blood's broken down, it becomes more hypodense, because isodense than hypodense. Initially, because of the high iron content in the blood, it's hyperdense. One to three weeks, it heads towards isodense, and then chronically becomes hypodense, similar to um, CSF. Let's have a look at some of those. So this is a 46-year-old gentleman involved with a high-speed MVA. He's obviously going to be an acute subdural hematoma. Um, you often have, have to take a second look whenever you see these subdurals. You can see the effects of it sometimes before you actually see the subdural. So you can see that there's CSF inside the sulci here, and there's to be pushed down on this side. Also, you can see that that lateral ventricle has been effaced, and there's been a bit of midline shift. And then when you look secondarily, you can see that there is that long, broad, uh, crescentic shape, acute subdural. What about this guy? This is a 68-year-old man, presents 10 days after a fall at home, confused with right side of weakness. So you'd be looking at something on the left-hand side of the brain. So it's 10 days later. Ah, it doesn't immediately jump out on you, at you. But again, we can see that there's, on this side, there's sulci, the CSF, and there's none on this side. There's a bit of compression or effacement of the lateral ventricles on this left-hand side. And then when you take a double, double take, you can see that, in fact, here is between there and there is this enormous subdural hematoma that's almost completely isodense with the surrounding one. You can even see there's a small, small isodense subdural up here also. But there's the massive one. Okay, a 76 year old nursing home patient, multiple falls presents being confused. So, well, this is a complicated looking one in that this CT shows. The chronic subdural on this side, in fact, there's one on the other side, isn't there? And then there's an acute subdural at the bottom here. In fact, they've been lying down flat in the CT and the heavier blood has dropped down and forms this layering. Their brain is actually sitting squished in the middle of here. No wonder you're confused. And because it's on both sides, you don't really get much effacement of the lateral ventricles because they're both squished, not one compared to the other. So with chronic subdurals, we said they're hypodense. And this is an example of chronic subdurals here, hypodense on both sides. This is a young brain, this is a child's or a toddler's brain. And this child, in fact, died from child abuse. What has happened, remember that there was, we're talking about subdurals occur when there's um, movement between in those, those bridging veins in the subdural space. Well, this has happened from a shaken baby syndrome from child abuse. This child unfortunately died. And there's the um, subdural hematomas, which are chronic. Quote, the art of medicine consists of amusing the patient while nature cures the disease. Actually, probably fairly true. Thanks, Voltaire. Let's move away from the trauma. We looked at, remember we said, we looked at the extradural, caught by the sutures, pushes in, lens-shaped, arterial, and we've looked at subdurals, the acute, crescentic, um, the isodense, subacute, and the chronic subdurals, the hypodense ones. We're now gonna to move to non-traumatic ones and look at stroke. Now stroke, of course, you have both thrombotic and embolic stroke and hemorrhagic stroke. So that thrombotic and embolic ones make up 75% of their ischemic stroke. And the other 25% or a hemorrhagic. So ischemic, as we said, emboli, thrombi, um, and if you um, have that occurring in very small vessels rather than the large ones, you can get those deep lacuna infarcts, which we'll show in a second. 
So you always need to know a bit more about the vascular territories. Relatively simple at the front here, this is two cuts of the CT scanner, showing at the front is the anterior cerebral artery territory, and of course the very commonly involved middle cerebral artery territory, here and here, and then the back is the posterior cerebral artery territory there and there. When you first get a thrombotic or an embolic um, stroke, you may see these very, very early signs. You actually may, may see a hyperdense vessel, an artery, and there's a very long hyperdense artery. Sometimes you'll just see it more as a blob. And uh, this does make you think, well, it's something that can be relatively rapidly reversed, either with um, thrombolysis in the appropriate patient or with clot retrieval. There's also, you can, very early on, you can see some, uh, and what's called an insular ribbon sign, the insular area gets a dematis. On one side compared to the other one, it looks a bit blurry. Most of the changes that you actually do see on CT take a while to occur um, as the edema increases. So at six to 12 hours, it starts to occur, maximum swelling at three to seven days. Then after that, it then, after that peak, it then goes, in, goes down to becoming encephalomalacia. So here, same person with two different CT scans. Um, <clears throat> similar sort of cuts, a little bit different, but you can see this is very early on from a left middle cerebral artery implant, and you can see the edema here with a loss of sulci. And then one week later, it's really delineated. There's still some edema around the area. We see the maximum of uh, about a week, but then after time, this will then, um, the fluid will be resorbed and you're getting cephalomalacia. Okay, remember we said about lacuna in France. So lacuna is a small lake, that's what lacuna means. And so when you get small parts, small areas like this, or this, or this, or this, or this, these are little lacuna areas. At the back here, you can actually see the cephalo infarct is part of the posterior circulation, oh, the posterior cerebral artery. So there's a lacuna, and there is an old left occipital infarct. Intracerebral bleeds, relatively easy to see, aren't they? Because they're white, they're acute. They've got you know, acute blood in it. Um, a lot of these from hypertensive hemorrhage or AV malformations, sometimes when you bleed into a neoplasm, you'll see it. We most commonly probably would see hypertensive bleeds. So here's a 55 year old bloke who's got right side of weakness. Of course, we look at the left hand side of the brain and fairly obviously is this large thalamic bleed of about three by three centimeters, quite deep in size. Here's a 24 year old man who's not a known epileptic who has a couple of seizures, uh, which is never a good sign. And in fact, there's this bleeding area. It doesn't really look like the sort of spot between the gray and white matter you get for a hypertensive bleed. It seems to be that spot. This is in fact from an AV malformation. I know that I'm intelligent because I know that I know nothing. That's what I live by. Thank you, Socrates, who came to a sticky ending. Acute subarachnoid hemorrhages. Now, people say, oh, you've got to be careful you don't use subarachnoid hemorrhages. It's true, of course. But most subarachnoid hemorrhages are pretty obvious. You see blood, which is white, in the subarachnoid space, uh, and which it normally has got black in it because normally there's CSF there. So the acute subarachnoid hemorrhages are only really difficult if you have grade one subarachnoids, a little bit of blood, or you have them and they present a bit later and that blood's already started to break down. So here's an example, and you can see, look, you're not going to miss that appearance, are you, of blood in the CSF space. This further down is actually where the bleed occurred. You can see the blob appearance. So that's a subarachnoid bleed. There's, there are certain tricks that you can look for. You can look for um, basal cistern blood that sometimes has like a smiley face here um, and look at the sulci um, at the, in the sylvian fissure because that's often where the blood will be. So here we go, a 44 year old lady developed sudden severe headache and vomiting. Well, it's a reasonable chance that you might have a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Not immediately obvious, but remember we said that Inside the sylvian fissure, you're meant to have black, you're meant to CSF in there. This isn't, this is white. 
This is all subrate noise blood. The subrate noise blood here, maybe a little bit of cough here too. And there's even a little bit of layering out of subrate noise blood here. Look at this one. This is a 46 year old man, worst headache of his life after having sexual intercourse. Again, not immediately obvious, but if you look at the sylvian fissure here, the sulci here, compared to this side, you can see there's blood inside there. So it really shouldn't be missed. Be yourself. Everyone else is already taken. Thank you, Oscar. So one of the questions that comes up is when do you use IV contrast? You're, you're trying to light up areas. When you've got cerebral abscess or you think the person might have a fungal infection, cochidia mycosis, blastomycosis, you know, cerebral lymphoma, um, or um, any sort of intracerebral mass, the, they will often show up um, when you give contrast. The reality is that you will do this initially, but in most times, if you find something like that, you'll end up going to an MRI, MRA. <clears throat> so cerebral abscess, this is what it looks like. And you can see that it's lit up on the outside there. Uh, tumors. So the first one I'll show you is a is a posterior fossa tumor. And you can see this posterior fossa tumor with secondary hydrocephalus. You shouldn't be seeing the temporal horns like this, certainly not. Um, and this looks all grossly swollen. So this is a posterior fossa tumor from a patient that came in following a seizure, unfortunately passed away, um, a young child. In an adult, here's a glioblastoma multiforme, um, causing massive compression of the lateral ventricles and compression of the surrounding cerebral tissue and some edema at the top here. When you've got metastases suspect, contrast does help. These, these, this person has got multiple metastases. Sure, you won't miss the fact there's edema everywhere. <clears throat> However, with contrast, it does show up the metastases very specifically and you can go on and you can tell it's contrast because you can see the, the vessels um, being shown up. <clears throat> okay. This is always what you should keep in the back of your mind when you're wondering whether you should ask a question. A man who asks is a fool for only five minutes. A man who never asks is a fool for life. So please keep questioning. And if you have any concerns or questions about cerebral CT scans, um, I'm more than happy to answer them. Uh, we've looked at a number of things. We've looked at basic extradurals and then subdurals, acute, subacute, and chronic. And we looked at subarachnoid hemorrhages. We've looked at CVAs, which are both um, the the ischemic and hemorrhagic ones, and then brief look at the use of contrast. And I think that'll just about do for um, an introductory view of some of the important CT scans that you'll have to come across for the week in the ED. If you've got any questions or any concerns, just get hold of me. I'm on alan, A L A N dot G I L E S at um, health, H E A L T H dot N S W dot gov dot A U. Thanks for listening um, and watching, and I'll see you all next time. Cheers. Stay well.